Welcome to Global Fest's Human Rights Forum. Please welcome our moderator for the day, Jill Croteau from Global News. Thank you and good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so kindly for joining us this afternoon, reserving some time in your lunch hour for some really important conversations. All week long, I've had the privilege of moderating and hosting these events, and it's been incredibly educational, enlightening, and encouraging to really just see some progress being made. So we invite you to join this conversation and participate along with us throughout the next hour and a half. I want to take this time now to introduce our interpreters for the day, Kimberly Johnson and Deb Russell. So please be aware that these scripts or these conversations are unrehearsed and unscripted. So our hosts didn't have any advanced material. Global Fest acknowledges Mokinstis as the traditional territory of the Blackfoot and the people of the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta, which includes Siksika, the Pekani, the Kainai, the Sutina, and the Stony Nakoda First Nations, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. Global is also home to the Métis Nation, Alberta, Region 3. Let us begin now with a message from Global Fest. Good afternoon and welcome to the Global Fest Human Rights Forum. My name is Ken Goosen and I have the privilege of serving as Global Fest Chief <coughs> Operating Officer. We started the journey of exploring issues around racism and discrimination back in 2005 when the City of Calgary signed on to the UNESCO Coalition of Municipalities Against Racism and Discrimination and how we as citizens of Calgary could become involved in the process through the lens of exploring practical solutions to address issues within our own actions and beliefs, our community, and then more broadly. The Global Fest Human Rights Forum, presented by the United Nations Association in Canada, Calgary branch, has been offered since 2007 as part of Global Fest programming to promote diversity, cross-cultural respect, and equality in our community. We're thrilled to have UNA Calgary as our presenting sponsor again this year. This year, we took our lead from the activities and protests that have been happening here in Calgary, across the nation, and internationally. Each day, we have a different panel of speakers with a different topic. Today's session will focus on Indigenous racism in Alberta. How can we address the very real mistrust of colonized systemic structures and institutions in Canada when the Indigenous person's experience has been fraught with cultural erasure, barriers to participation, and acts of violence directed at Indigenous individuals because of their indigeneity. I would like to welcome our audiences outside of Calgary who have joined us today through our newest institutional partnerships with the Institute of Canadian Citizenship and the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. Glad you have joined in our conversation this week. Before the session begins, I would like to thank Jill Croteau, our amazing moderator. Jill, it's great to have you back again this year. Programs like this would not be possible without financial support. And at this time, I would like to thank all our sponsors and funding partners for their generous support and commitment to this collective cause. Thank you for joining us today, and we all look forward to a meaningful conversation. Thank you for that, Ken. Global Fest would like to thank their funding partners, United Nations Association of Canada, Calgary Branch, the Calgary Catholic Immigration Society, the Canadian Red Cross, the City of Calgary, the province of Alberta, and the Government of Canada. Global Fest is also looking forward to continuing partnerships with the Institute for Canadian Citizenship and the Six Degrees Forum and Canadian Museum for Human Rights. We do look forward to this conversation as mentioned. For those of you who have joined us, there is a Q&A icon at the bottom of this screen. So we do invite you to participate, plug your questions in there. We will have some time at the end of these presentations to get to your questions and hopefully facilitate that conversation. I also wanna mention that some of these conversations may get a little uncomfortable for people, but we want to remind everyone that this is a very brave and respectful space. So sure that um, we give people our attention and respect to hear about their lived experiences. Today's session is on Indigenous racism in Alberta. Many Canadians believe racism isn't that bad in Canada and turn a blind eye to our Indigenous people. To begin to understand how we can look to be a part of the solution, we need to look back at our history. And the session is going to take us back 
And it's also going to take us forward with educators who are working directly with youth in Alberta making significant change. Our two speakers today are Miss K and Miss O. Miss K has worked in social justice since she was very young and lectures at the universities in Calgary on how to support Indigenous and BIPOC students as an educator and liaison mentor, both systemically and within the classroom. She's established programming for Indigenous students that went beyond victim narratives into resiliency, and it resulted in the dropout rates of Indigenous students in schools going from 60% of dropouts to zero and 99% transitioning into a post-secondary position of their choice. The 1% was a student who entered the workforce, which was their personal goal. She's going to take us back to the beginning to see how we have normalized injustice within our institutions and ourselves by breaking down ideologies and learn how to be make, making change. Ms. O is Nuchano and Anishinaabe. She began her career in social work and has been an educator for the past 16 years. She has worked in supporting teachers and promoting anti-hate in their classroom and decolonizing space. She created and facilitated a school program which is decolonized and students learn the academic curriculum through indigenous ways of knowing and supporting the whole person and the community. Over three years, this has led to a graduation rate of approximately 95% for students in the program. She has a master's of education, which focused on creating successful spaces for indigenous women and girls through decolonization and respecting traditional learning. You may have noticed that uh, the cameras are off for our two speakers. It is because of their work in social justice um, that has also made them targets, unfortunately. So for that reason, we are going to keep their names to ourselves and their videos off. I would like to give a very warm welcome to both Miss K and Miss O. Humble to be in your presence. You are both change makers. And I personally am very looking forward to your presentation today. So I'm going to hand it over now to the both of you. Thank you and welcome. Sorry about that, I had a problem unmuting. <laughs> um, I'm Miss O, and I am very happy to be here today and welcome to everybody who is here listening. I'm just gonna share a screen with you. And then we'll get started. Uh, so decolonizing as a road to combat hate, uh, we're, we are going to take you into the past and into the present and hopefully give you ideas for the future as we move through this. Uh, we want to, sorry, I'm having technology difficulties, there we go, okay. Uh, Okay, so we want to look at a land acknowledgement. Most of you are on the Blackfoot territory, which was already recognized. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we have some Blackfoot voice with the land acknowledgement. Looking at Dr. Leroy Little Bear, who is an amazing Blackfoot man, uh, every society in one way or another lays claim to a territory within that claim territory. A culture arises from the mutual relationship with the land. It is through this mutual relationship with the land that culture, icons, symbols and images, values, customs, ceremonies, stories, songs, and beliefs of the people are developed. These in turn are embodied in the way, in the very being of the people. I really wanted to touch on this land acknowledgement because land acknowledgement really does need to go beyond something we say at the beginning of a meeting. Uh, in order to recognize the people whose land we are on. I feel it's very important to recognize that it goes beyond just the, the land that we are on, but who we are fundamentally as Indigenous people on our own territories. Uh, that is our lifeline. That is our process to healing from historical and current injustices. And in order to make a land acknowledgement something meaningful, we actually have to be doing the anti-hate work and the decolonizing work. So things like fishermen getting attacked on their traditional territories and their cars burnt and 
having their livelihood threatened doesn't happen because if we're doing land acknowledgements and those brutalities are still happening, it's not effective. So looking beyond just the words, but really understanding what the land means to us. I'm gonna take you way back now and it's in connection to land and the healing purpose of land. I'm gonna tell you a very short version of my own family story uh, in order to get a full understanding, hopefully, of how intergenerational trauma is impacting and how decolonization is actually one of the healing processes by connecting back to land. Uh, my Nanisk, which is my grandfather, as far as we know, did go to residential school. He never talked about it. Uh, the interesting thing with my Nanisk is I only knew him as a slightly older man. My understanding is he wasn't as happy of a fellow before, my, before I came along. Uh, one of the things to recognize about him is that he went back to his traditions and to his land and focused on living how we traditionally would have lived uh, and the healing that comes with that, whether it's physical healing through medicines or spiritual healing through medicines. Uh, and and that connection. So by the time I came along, I spent a significant part of my childhood with him. Uh, and he was the reason I am who I am today. If we look at my father on the other side of my family who also went to residential school, um, he went the opposite direction. He, through residential school, he was thought that our ways were savage and that our ways were no good. And the only way to be a human being in society was to change and to let go of who we were as indigenous people. So he actually, if you look at him from a Western perspective was quite successful. Uh, he made lots of money. He moved up in businesses. Uh, the problem was that he never healed, he never went back to our lands, and he never took the time to regain what was stolen from him in residential school. Uh, he was brutalized in every single way that he could have been in residential school. He dealt with massive sexual assaults, physical assaults, removal of culture, uh, he had food experiments done on him. And then he was sent back to his home with no support and no healing. And the hate for his own people and himself because of what he was taught at residential school. Um, the problem with that is, is when we don't heal, we keep passing this on from generation to generation. Now, my grandfather took the route of passing his traditions on to my generation and the healing and the positivity. My father didn't have that opportunity. And so he, the times I spent in my parents' house, I was very much raised like I was in a residential school with those same experiences. I don't hold on to anger because I know why it happened, but what that's done is that has created complete generational disconnect. Um, not only did I suffer from my own trauma, and fall into the stereotypes of Indigenous people, of being on the street, of being a drug addict, of dropping out of high school. Um, I had no family. I was completely disconnected from that. Once my Ninisk passed on and, and my grandmother, I had no family. Uh, and I went on a really bad path. How I healing was through going back to the land. Um, that happened after this residential trauma managed to pass on to yet another generation. So that's my, that's a picture of my own family, siblings and cousins, all piled in there. Uh, all of us went through our own trauma and many of the people in that picture are no longer alive and with us. That's part of intergenerational trauma. Uh, suicide rates are much higher in people who have significant childhood trauma. 
uh, especially if there's no healing and no supports to help you through that. So I then had a child very young um, and she is amazing. Uh, she's a grown woman now, but she's very amazing. She had to deal with the results of residential school as well. She was raised without grandparents because my grandparents, my parents were unable to find healing. Um, they continue to be in a place where the residential school experience dictates who they are as, as humans and, and they're very, very ill and are unable to show love. Um, and so she was raised without that family and she was also raised without a huge trust in men because of that history uh, and she was raised without a father and just by myself so the positives is this brought out this very strong independent young lady who thrives on her connections with with other strong women um, and she has gone back to her tradition and her culture in order to heal as well nature has been her healing spot so that's a very, very shortened version of intergenerational, uh, intergenerational trauma and the impact. But I really felt that we needed to go to this place and understand intergenerational trauma. We talk a lot about residential schools and sometimes people have a hard time connecting why residential schools are relevant to our current anti-hate and activism fight. And I'm hoping that gives you a little bit more picture into that and I'm going to pass it over to uh, Ms. Kay now to talk about allyship and cultural safety. Thank you so much Ms. So. Oki uh, Tansianin everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, very much appreciative that we're able to uh, keep our videos off and still be able to share this knowledge and education right now. Um, so I wanted to speak today uh, just to go off of what Ms. O is saying about how we have these terms like intergenerational trauma. We have um, events that we learn about, but the ripple effects of those events and the very unique and individual situations of those events get lost unless we share our stories. Um, I know right now there's a, a huge desire uh, for people to not just do things to help, but to do things in a right and correct way. Um, so that conversation is a constant one. It's a living conversation. It never really ends. Uh, with each individual that we come across, we have to understand and appreciate and have compassion for the unique experiences of that individual. And you know, I, I moved to here to Treaty 7 territory and, you know, although I have an extensive background, knowledge base, I was a stranger here. I had to learn new protocols, language, uh, become invested in the community in a way where uh, I could be trusted as somebody who wasn't exploitative. And because of, you know, my history, I understand that these uh, relationships take time. And that's actually how it should be in any healthy relationship. Uh, it should take time. It should uh, be, you only move along at the speed of trust. And so when we talk about allyship and cultural safety, we start right at the beginning. You know, there's two terms that I see getting thrown around quite a lot, um, indigenize and decolonize. And for some people, these terms are uh, interchangeable. But the reality is, is that these terms aren't uh, interchangeable. And we're going to go into that in the next slide. But, um, oh, just put, bring me back up there, Miss. Oh, thank you. But when it comes to allyship, I feel like sometimes people become stagnated um, in not knowing which direction to go and feeling complicit in silence, feeling complicit in inaction. So I actually took this from an incredible resource. You can find the link at the bottom there, uh, Treaty 7 Indigenous Ally Toolkit. This was done with the uh, Calgary Foundation. And, you know, as we've kind of been discussing systemic privilege, as we've been talking about 
uh, systemic injustice and oppression, you know, we have to start to really, the way I break it down for people is you have to think about it as if, and we know that it has been illegal to be a minority ethnic person throughout history. And even in a lot of ways that has become embedded into our institutional structure. So the system in and of itself requires fervent action on us to change because that system just like dirt in water has settled and we think it works but all you have to do is shake up the water glass and you realize it still has to be cleaned out We're, there's still so many aspects of our systems that are rooted in and engaged in and perpetuating a system of oppression upon indigenous people so it being an Indigenous person is a crime, historically a crime. Currently, perceptions of Indigenous people are stereotypical or as criminal or as people who are not uh, people who can fit in to the system and all of these uh, really colonized conceptions. Um, the best way to think about it is, well, then if it's a crime, then you're my accomplice. You're in the getaway car with me as we drive away from the scene of the crime. And the scene of the crime being, you know, anti-racist behavior where we are trying to break down these systems. And so, you know, with, when we're talking about an ally, this is like a person who is there every step of the way, uh, able to humble themselves into a position of support. And, you know, humility and generosity are two traits that are so significant to the, the territory I come from originally. Um, the greatest gift you can be given is generosity uh, or a spirit of generosity or a spirit of humility and compassion. And so that's really the starting point is, can you humble yourself and allow your experiences to take a back seat to the experiences and the current needs of another person? An accomplice is somebody who, when they see things happen within the system, you know, they'll be out there protesting. Maybe they'll sign petitions. Maybe they will, uh, you know, give a good job reference for a friend who's Indigenous. Or even, you know, I had friends where they were in, unable to find an apartment. They had to go to 12 different apartments and, you know, both employed, both with impeccable credit, couldn't get a place to live. Do you make a reference? Do you do that extra call? Now a co-resistor or a co-conspirator, depending on who you talk to, is somebody who, although they might not identify with an oppressed minority, they are consistent. They are consistent in their intent to disrupt and deconstruct how these institutions continue a history and a legacy of colonization and oppression and racism. So you have to ask yourself on this journey, where are you at and how far do you wanna go? Because the reality is, is that from my experience, when you start to become involved in a deeper way, in a way where you are embedded, where it's not just a season of your life, but years of your life, you will find yourself feeling as if you're jumping between these roles. But what it really is about is, <clears throat> How do I affect change using whatever privileges, whatever opportunities I have been given to share with another? And that really falls back to an indigenous worldview of interconnectedness. You know, we don't gain anything without going together. So speaking of indigenous, and, uh, the next slide will kind of go into this. These two terms get used a lot right now, indigenized versus decolonized. Some of you might've already heard some of these words being used. Um, I've kind of, you know, asked people in the community, elders, I've asked, you know, scholars, professors, uh, community activists, fellow Indigenous friends and teachers, and we've just tried to understand the differences between these two. Now, decolonization and indigenization are not the same thing, although they are used interchangeably. I think of it like this, and I'm gonna start with indigenization because that was the term I first heard being used quite a bit. Indigenization, it's a starting point. Um, it doesn't yet 
accept the fact that what we are actually talking about are two unique and separate worldviews. These are two worldviews that um, are, if you actually look at them deeper, are inherently in conflict. Um, we have one worldview where it's very individualist, it's very, um, it's about ownership, it's about uh, consumption and greed. Um, it's also about binaries and very clear cut distinctions. Whereas the other worldview is not, it's, uh, it's in, in many cases, not all cases, but in many cases it's matriarchal, interconnected. Um, a, a community of sharing, of giving, of protocols, of boundaries, of stewardship. So it's impossible for us to indigenize a system that is inherently non-indigenous. It's almost like a Frankenstein's monster. I mean, it's Halloween, but it's like a Frankenstein's monster of worldviews where you are actually just attaching or glomping on one to the other. Now, this is kind of where we've been dancing for a few decades as slowly um, indigenous representation has become more evident in institutions, in educational systems, healthcare, but not enough. And I think that because we're indigenizing, that's why it's not enough, because it still means that you're building on something that is inherently at odds with what you were trying to uphold and support and represent. Decolonizing is a taking away. What this means, if I were to say we were going to indigenize education, this would mean we do orange shirt day events. This would mean we had workshops, we brought in elders and residents, um, provided honorariums and tobacco, conducted things among the proper protocols. That would be indigenizing. Decolonizing would look like having those elders deeply involved in the administrative infrastructure of the school. It would look like having an event all the time, whether big or small, consistently occurring throughout your business or your school. It's an embedded concept. It, it basically means I these educational practices were perfect to begin with. We have to take away the extra colonized viewpoints to get to the true spirit. And it's funny because in recent years, when you hear words like building capacity, uh, an all school or all company approach, a holistic worldview. These are all concepts that have been taken from indigenous culture and have been rewritten in this context. And so <clears throat> I think that if you're looking to, of why we've stagnated, the reason why is because this is really a question that only white as we call or say white people can do for themselves. And the reason why, you know, we say that is, <clears throat> you know, people have been colonized the world over. Indigenous people have been colonized recently, but if we go back throughout history, this seems to be a consistent practice going all the way back to Roman empirical times. And so when we talk about decolonizing yourself, we mean, not only decolonizing your conceptions about indigenous people, but maybe even decolonizing your conceptions about your own heritage and your own history and returning to the land and the teachings of your people. If you're going to, if you're Scottish, going and learning those stories, learning that tradition. I think people understand what this is when we talk about it from that perspective. But when we speak of it from the indigenous perspective, it feels foreign, even though it is traditional to this land. Um, so as we kind of speak, as we go through and me and Miss O kind of go through, I, I really just wanted to clarify what we're trying to do here when we say we're decolonizing. Um, we're trying to take away, we're trying to clear the glasses, we're trying to show really as close as we can get to what that looked like at its purest form, because in my experience, when we do that, you have the most success in helping people in um, the term that we use is a uh, Minoba Mazadawin. And Minoba Mazadawin means the way of the good life, whatever that is for that person. And the only way that we can get that person to that good life is by honoring and respecting not only where they came from within their lifetime, but the lifetime of their ancestry and everything that stretches back as far as we can go. 
So thank you so much. I'm going to give it back to Ms. O. <laughs> Um, thank you, Ms. K. It's, it's very strange for us. I have to say, K and I usually just have a conversation. So um, usually we'd be talking back and forth. So I just do want to talk on a little bit what Ms. K said there. If we look at decolonization in education, in the workplace, um, really anywhere, if you think of it as starting from the Indigenous way of the people whose land we reside on uh, and then working what has to be there as far as say bylaws or curriculum in after the fact. So fitting the Western perspective in to the Indigenous perspective, the Indigenous perspective being the overriding uh, way of doing things. Well, one of the things that I'm currently working on is creating bylaws that do that. So if you look at society bylaws, they're very much uh, Eurocentric way of decision making, of board of directors uh, having a hierarchy, things like that. So, decolonizing is saying, okay, so this is how we, as in, as for myself, as an internal woman, makes decisions traditionally. Now, how can I make sure that all the bylaw things fit into that? Uh, so it's always starting with that Indigenous perspective uh, and then working out. And you would do that on any land that you are on, whether it is here on Turtle Island or it is somewhere else in the world. You, you build off of whose land you're on and then go from there. Uh, not that Indigenizing is wrong, so I don't want anybody to think all the Indigenizing work they've been doing is a misstep in any way. Uh, it, it just doesn't lend itself to getting into deeper understanding. And through deeper understanding, we combat hate. The only way to combat hate is through understanding. Uh, I am actually going to pass it right back to uh, Ms. K. She's going to talk a little bit about decolonizing school culture. Uh, and then I'll come back and talk a little bit on that as well in practice. So back over to you, Ms. K. Thank you so much, Miss O. So um, as it was mentioned, I, I headed a program that was um, set up to support Indigenous student dropout. That was really the main focus. But, you know, I, I had just come to Alberta and I was I was honest. I said, you know, I'm not from this treaty territory. You should hire someone from this treaty territory to do this work um, before you hire anyone outside. And the, the reason why that was so shocking was because, you know, we don't think of things like that, but I firmly see myself as a guest on this land. And, and my, my role as a guest has been given by people of this land whose communities I've helped, the families I've helped. So I entered my uh, program just with a list of kids' names, just with student names. And before I even concerned myself with the school culture, as a whole. I wanted to meet each and every single one of these students individually, get to know their stories. Another part of it was creating a safe space, a culturally safe space. And what that meant was that, and I was lucky to be in, um, in a, a school where this work was really supported by the administration. Um, so it was never an issue to smudge in the school. Um, there was not a lot of red tape. Um, I just had to like let people know who, who might be sensitive, but overall, like we would be able to smudge any time the students needed it. Uh, so for the students to come into a space that felt like a second home and almost like a place of pride in the sense that they would invite non-Indigenous friends. Um, teachers would spend time in the space just hanging out with the students and getting to know them on a personal, non-hierarchical level. And that is an Indigenous way of doing things, but it wasn't done as in like an announcement of this is what we're doing in this space. It was just done by creating that space. And right from the beginning, you know, having elders involved from the very first meeting that we had on what we were doing in the space, we had students, families, and elders from the community that were from the nations of these families come to give us guidance, come to, and and giving us guidance that we wouldn't normally 
initially think of, you know, and Elder was the reason that we found out that our school, which had been built in the 70s, had a history of being a school where kids who were um, taken from their families uh, during the 60s scoop would be placed in the school in an Indigenous space, but it had a negative connotation. It was an oppressive connotation. And I was so grateful to this elder for letting me know this as I was new to Alberta because I had parents who were nervous and scared when we first started the program to find out that their son or their daughter was in our space because they had such negative connotations and had to assure parents that this is what this space is. Um, so it really is something, and this is why, like I, I just always bring it back to that deeper understanding. There is no aspect of your life that will not be affected personally by this work. I have seen non-Indigenous colleagues begin this work just trying to start an assignment. They wanna do an assignment. And it starts to change their connection, not only to that assignment, but to their students, to their role as an educator. Um, and I've seen this actually happen to people in every walk of life, in their profession, in their personal life. It changes the whole way that you relate to the world and others. So when it came to our restorative justice protocols, um, you know, we started doing, uh, when a student was in a situation that was a difficult situation, we would bring everybody in so that it was a circle so that this student could look around and see how many people cared about the student. And these conversations, we would ensure that there wouldn't be a deadline on them so that they could flow naturally, you know, so that they could be, so that we didn't spend 30 minutes only talking about what had been done wrong. We mostly spent 30 minutes just talking about life and and things that were happening, you know, this is, um, it's like kind of why we give tobacco. There's so many stories, there's so many reasons, but I always see tobacco as like a gift of your time. It's a gift of saying like, you are my highest priority right now. And for a student who is feeling erased, for a student who is feeling um, oppressed, to be seen and loved in that way, gives that student the safety, gives anyone the safety to feel like, Failure does not define you. You are not defined by this one event. This event is connected to many events in your life that are creating the person that you are meant to be. And that person is a beautiful person. So we would also do this with students who had been racist to uh, an indigenous student or school. We would actually do both sides. So if a student had been racist or had exhibited um, a racist behavior, Maybe they were inappropriate around an elder. Maybe they had said something during an event. Um, maybe they had commented on a student's regalia. That student would actually be brought into the conversation. And a lot of times these students, once they kind of bridge the shame of having done something like that, when they saw that there was no hard feelings that we could actually get to a place of reconciling that conflict, they were some of the greatest allies, accomplices, and co-resistors in the school. And a lot of that was learned behavior. So we did restorative justice on both sides. Um, and a lot of that too even happened with, you know, colleagues, you know, so if an educator had messed up with a student, bringing that teacher into that conversation, um, because that's really what safety is. It's about seeing where people are at, and adjusting and determining and being discerning enough to know when it's time for us to speak separate and when it's time for us to come together. This is actually a teaching I've learned many years ago where traditionally if there was a conflict to separate the individuals, to speak to both. And then when the time is right to either bring those people together or to bring a symbolic meaning of the people together because we are in this community trying to make things work. Um, I mentioned with cultural protocols and traditional knowledge, you know, we had ceremonies where um, we would have teas often, elders and residents, so elders would just like be coming in, we would pay honorarium, we would have tobacco and gifts, and just spend time with students and staff. And just that time is something that we don't really get in the Western educational model. It almost like sets us up for the work world. And so it's like between this time and this time you do this, this time and this time you have lunch and this time and this time you do this and then you go home. 
in an indigenous educational model, the education never stops. It's just always on an ebb and flow throughout your lifetime. And so, you know, smudging was something that was non-negotiable for our space. Um, I was always shocked when I would hear about these regulations that other uh, schools would have to go through because you can't determine when a student is going to need smudge and smudge is traditional medicines of this land. Um, tobacco protocols. We had gone to a point where if anything was asked of an elder, if we had anyone come to the school to share knowledge, um, whether that was a journalist from APTN or a local Blackfoot DJ, we would always gift traditionally and and wrapped and presented in the way that is traditional to Treaty 7 territory. Not only is the gift and the honorarium and the tobacco a protocol, it's also so meaningful because on another level, it's like you're giving another gift of a thank you, of sharing your knowledge and your time. Um, and that's really where we get into like a holistic model and why it works so well. Um, you know, I saw students where, you know, they had maybe three weeks left of school. They were sitting at a, such a low grade, they thought they couldn't redeem themselves. And all they needed was someone to come in who knew that system and was able to say, okay, well, actually, if you do these three things and these two things, you'll be at a 50%. And people don't trust that. But when you go every step of the way, when you walk beside somebody, you can actually give them that support so that when the momentum finally kicks off, they can go on their own. This is an active behavior. So during parent-teacher nights, for instance, I spoke with the staff about how, you know, take time if one of your students or the parents are Indigenous. You know, I will meet the parent outside, bring the parent or the family or the grandparent in. Um, so they don't have to walk into the school alone if I feel like they might feel uncomfortable doing so or that they might have anxiety about it. But even just taking your time during the conversation, you know, waiting 10 seconds before you respond or giving someone that space to express themselves, that's a cultural thing. It's why sometimes there is no rush because we're just here in this moment trying to work this out. These are cultural differences. I've seen it when we did uh, streaming for students. A lot of students who are Indigenous, many students are now being raised with Indigenous languages being their first languages. It's because there's a concerted effort to try to keep these languages alive. So a lot of Indigenous students were not being streamed into English as a second language. They were being streamed lower due to dialectic differences from what had been taught through indigenous first languages and dialects on reserve. Once we pinpointed this and we started saying, no, this student isn't showing a lack of literacy, this student is actually showing dual linguistic ability and putting the student in English as a second language to learn when to use formal language and when to use original language. These students would excel. Just that one change switched and created an opportunity for disenfranchised students to achieve success. And that is, a, that in and of itself was an institutional unconscious bias. It was nothing for people to think, well, this other student from this other country has these issues, but it was really difficult for people to see that the indigenous students were having those uh, similar issues because we sometimes fail to see indigenous peoples as an original separate entity, sovereign entity of this land with own language, own customs. It's always been that the indigenous people have to assimilate to the Western colonized viewpoint, not the other way around. And that one switch of a worldview changed everything for these students. Um, so, it always came back, I think the reason why we had so much success was because we approached everything from what is in the best interest of in the person in front of me, the indigenous person in front of me. Um, for example, when we talk about decolonizing versus indigenizing, in classes, many indigenous students 
whose parents were residential school survivors would feel ostracized or have a spotlight on them when the subject of residential schools came up in class. Now, residential schools is a subject that when many of us were in school, we didn't learn. And so it's important that this is part of that education, bring the truth. This is part of that truth of truth and reconciliation, the truth of the genocide, the truth of the oppression. But this was not in any way supporting the student. It was not in any way helping that Indigenous student learn more because they already knew those stories. It was only making that student feel more ostracized. So what we would do is that we would ask the student, you know, about their heritage. And, you know, if the student said, oh, I'm Cree or, you know, I'm Lakota, we would connect that student with an elder or a community leader in their own nation to teach the student during the period of time where other students who are non-Indigenous or who are unfamiliar with residential schools learn that history, the Indigenous student would learn instead about language, culture, ceremony, tradition. We would set up a fund for students, for honorariums, to gift to elders for a naming ceremony. If that was in the student's uh, plan that they discussed with the elder for what they wanted to self-actualize themselves. And then the student would just return back after doing a project or an assignment about what they learned. Something that small, indigenizing would be having the student in the class to learn that history, but to decolonize it is to go bring the student, what would this student's education look like before residential schools? And we tried our best. And you know, at our graduation ceremonies, we were one of the first schools who um, you know, had elders who were available and we had donations from all over Canada um, of eagle feathers. And for four years, indigenous students were able to receive an eagle feather with their diploma at the end, which was, I remember we had a grandparent, a grandfather who was a residential school survivor come up crying because he never thought he'd see the day where one of his granddaughters would not only receive a diploma, but an eagle feather upon, uh, becoming 18. And I think that in a nutshell is really what we're trying to do here uh, today. We're trying to find ways where it's not just meaningful to one side or the other, but where both sides can feel the real and powerful healing of what it means to come together from that mindset, from that worldview. So thank you so much. Thanks, Kay. Um... My Wi-Fi has been on and off, so I'm sorry if I end up picking out here on you. Uh, I just want to touch quite quickly on a program as well. On the left of your screen there, the principles of learning, that's a resource that comes from British Columbia, and it is something that all educators are supposed to use within their classrooms. Uh, and it's quite, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I just put it there for you guys to take a look at very important around Indigenous education not being necessarily about just bringing in things like dancers and drums, which are a very important part of our cultures, but also bringing in the ways of being in the world. And I think for those of you who are not in the education world, I think it's important to show you how this applies also to your own workplace or your own life. One of the things with decolonization is that it creates a space, and they address this, but it creates a space that is safe for everybody. My particular school program I've been working on for the last uh, three years now, many of our students are Indigenous, about 85%, and about 15% are non-Indigenous. Uh, with that said, Indigenous students in the program, we've only had one student who is from the nation whose land we run the program on. So the decolonization process allows all of the students to engage in who they are uh, as Indigenous or non-Indigenous students and explore their own cultures and their own histories and their own languages. Through connections with elders or connections with each other, uh, we often have family groups come through the program together, uh, different grade levels or the same grade level. 
So decolonization piece can be applied to any place of work uh, or any setting, whether it's community meetings, anything like that, because once you decolonize it, what it does is it gives every person in that circle uh, that's having a conversation a voice. Uh, it gives everybody a chance to speak and it makes everyone equal. So it's really important to recognize that what we're doing in the schools can also be applied outside of the schools. So our program is students get credits in academic courses, uh, but it starts with Indigenous learning. So we learn on the land with elders. Uh, we have had some challenges with COVID because we can't go on food trips or anything like that, but we try to bring it back to the land. We try to connect with the land. Uh, what we have seen in our students and from talking and, and scanning our students about what works for them and what doesn't because we do want their voice is that the number one aspect that has assisted them in graduation is the sense of community that we have in our program. Uh, a lot of what Ms. Kay has done with her program, very similar principles. Um, but the sense of community and that feeling like you belong. And so belonging is not just for teenagers, it's also for adults. And as we decolonize, we give people a place to have that sense of belonging. We build resiliency in other human beings. We give them a safe space. And through doing that, it allows us to trust our allies. As an Indigenous person, I, for a long time, did not trust anybody that was Caucasian because of my own history with people who were. Uh, and having safe spaces made me be able to have that trust for people outside of my own community. Uh, so decolonization really creates a safe space no matter where you are. Uh, and again, going back to the land is also something that can be applied to any area, any workplace, any community organization. If you get out on the land, especially if you start to join the community of the people whose land you're on and ask them with proper protocol and gifts uh, to take you out on the land and just be with you out there. You don't even have to ask them to teach you. They will choose to if they would like to, but just being out on the land with people whose, whose traditions for thousands and thousands of years are part of that land. It builds community within your workplace. It also builds a safe space and a better understanding for allyship. Uh, I am going to move on. I know we are, uh, Kay and I can talk and we could be on here for hours. So we're not gonna do that. I am gonna move on to just a quick poem that for me summarizes this idea of, of balance uh, between understanding histories and current injustices and, and who we are as indigenous people throughout Turtle Island. Uh, so I'm gonna read that to you and then I'll pass it on to Ms. Kay after that. So. I am from the colonized, the brutalized and the shamed. I'm from the needles, the red dress, the aroma that can never be explained. I am from the cage, the dark one, the cold one, the alone one, the one that becomes the comfort I used to crave. I am from the sage, the fireweed, the cedar, and all the you. I am from the warriors who died and saved these gifts for me. I am from my Nanusk, who gently showed me the way. I am from the land, the ancestors, the Nishunnels and Anishinaabe. I am from the water where the otter embraced the world around her, but as the traumas and tragedies against her home overwhelmed her play, she had but two choices, go deep to the red coral where her ancestors lay, or do what is expected by all who observe, be static and stay. She will come up to visit the moon and play in the sun, but the red coral past is where she is from. Over to you, Kay. Oh, thank you so much, Ms. O. That was beautiful. Um, so I guess, you know, I'll just tell a story. When I first came to uh, Treaty 7 territory, I was homesick. I was homesick for my territory. I was homesick for so many things that I can't even express in a short amount of time. But there were moments where I remember I was um, at a circle with a, an elder um, from Treaty 7 territory. And I burst into tears uh, during the smudge because the scent 
made me feel even more homesick. And this elder looked at me and they just said, you know, you're home. This is Turtle Island. These borders, these provinces mean nothing. You're home. And it was the kindest thing that he could have said at that time, because it reminded me that, you know, when we speak about Indigenous history, when we speak about what has happened to Indigenous peoples, we fall into these traps of labels, categories, and archetypes, you know. And I know that for a lot of allies, you know, that, that savior archetype is one that leaves a bad taste in their mouth. Um, but I think of one way that we can help allies to switch that feeling of incapacity, to switch that feeling of guilt or shame or a lack of knowing where they fit in is to remind people that the story of Indigenous peoples is one of resilience and strength, not just victimization and infantilization. Yes, we understand we have to learn this truth of genocide and oppression. And, but we also have to understand that the reason why we have things like smudge, fancy dance, jingle dresses, songs, language, these teachings, and these teachings that we are now reconnecting with, whether we are Indigenous peoples from this land or not, but we are connecting to this idea of interconnectedness. You know, I, I suffer that word globalization because it has so many colonized and capitalistic implications. So it's more about an interconnected understanding and recognizing that these medicines that are and these teachings that are leading us into the now, right now when our world is so discordant and chaotic, where we see the earth suffering, we have to understand that we have these medicines and these ceremonies that sustain us because elders and people in the past hid them. They protected them. They kept these stories and these teachings safe. And against all odds, against imprisonment, death, starvation, dehumanization, still maintaining them. And in my viewpoint, we're our strength is determined by what we have endured and survived and risen from. And in that regards, Indigenous people and the story of the Indigenous history is one of resiliency and immense strength. And once we start to see it as that, it gives one hope. It gives a person hope because in the Anishinaabe tradition, and Miss O and I speak of this often, um, there's a prophecy of the seventh fire prophecy. And you can actually look this prophecy up. Somebody was kind enough to write it up and post it online, but um, it, each fire represents a different generation of the story of what happened to indigenous people upon first contact. And currently this generation of youth that are coming up are that seventh fire generation. And the prophecy says that they will lead us into the right way as the new people, that they will reconnect us back to what is important. But if we fall victim to materialism, if we fall victim to superficiality and greed, we doom ourselves. And I think at this point in time, looking to indigenous people for guidance on how to reconnect with one another not only on Turtle Island, but globally, is the next step. And days like today are a huge part of that connection. So I just want to thank you all, Chi Miigwech, for being here today. Um, thank you so much. Well, thank you to both of you. I'm humbled to hear some of the things that you're saying and really honor the impressive work that you're doing. I think it's such a beautiful way of incorporating your teachings into our schools. And I, I think in this utopian world, wouldn't that be magical to have that in all of our schools? And I guess that's where the question that I have for both of you is where is that level of hope in really decolonizing these schools. I mean, these things that you're, you're doing about these gifting tobaccos, giving this eagle feather at graduation, simple things, but so profound and really speak volumes. Is there a sense of hope that we can really start to incorporate these traditions and these measures of respect in all of our schools? 
Well, I will speak to that first, if you want, Ms. Kay. So I've worked beyond the classroom. I have also worked for um, a rather large school district. Um, as someone who is attempting to get that into the schools. But I actually do have a lot of hope that this will happen. I'm also very realistic that it may take a significant amount of time. And there's a couple reasons for that. I would say one of them is mindset. Uh, the powers that be need to see this as the importance that it is and the benefit to all children uh, that it gives, not just for our Indigenous students, because the government as well needs to see that, because once the value is seen, the funding comes, because the reality is, is it's not free to do this, and I know Ms. Kay and myself often work on a rather small budget. Uh, we both work currently in schools that our administrators are wonderful and will find money for us to do this, uh, but it needs to be a more systemic thing that happens and then the hope can grow greater. And that's only gonna happen if people see the value in it. Our elders can't be coming and working for free. Uh, the elders I work with here, it's a full-time job what they're doing, meeting with teachers and students uh, and in crisis situations and those kind of things. So they actually can't work a typical full-time job. We need to be able to pay them for their work. They, they can't do it for free and most of them would do it for free. And it's not okay for us to ask them to do that. So it costs money. I'll pass it to you, Ms. Kay. Yeah, and there's um, a great um, quote by Dr. Cornell West. Uh, he's a scholar I'm quite fond of. And he says, you know, I, I struggle to be an optimist <laughs> these days, I, I struggle but I have to be a prisoner of hope. I have to be, a, I just have to be hopeful. And, you know, it's funny because there have been many bleak instances where bureaucracy and red tape, I mean, just to go off what Miss O was saying, um, the struggle to explain that honorariums are not free money is one that I have had to argue many times over. And, you basically just have to say it outright where it's like, you know, we have elders that are gonna get their electricity shut off, but they're hosting 500 people at a university. Like we need to recognize that this knowledge, if we want it to sustain, we have to sustain the people who are the carriers of that knowledge. And I remember like, cause our program was heavily defunded. Um, and I remember that like, those moments of hope that I think back on are like, you know, when you remember the students you've had and the families you've met with, um, you know, to have a student who's two spirit in grade 10, want to drop out of school, who was hugely at risk and is currently starting university. Like a, that, that to me shows that Yes, the system is tangled and it's an intricate web of colonization that has permeated and poisoned every institution. But all we have to do is break that down and get it out of those barriers out of the way. And you can prove that these models and these systems actually inhibit what they like pretend to be about because in dismantling those bureaucratic systemic structures that were not in any way from an indigenous model, that student soared. And they didn't soar because it was made easier. It's not about bringing the barrier down. It's about maintaining that, like a level of you can do anything, but we understand that the system itself is based on a white supremacist structure. So let's just get that out of the way. And let's see how far you can go without that. And when you've seen it time and time again, it's almost like it's sort of like you, you, you're, you've seen past the curtain, past the illusion. And so when people come up to you with these bureaucratic terminologies that you know are just uh, checkpoints on a person, whether they're a student or an adult, trying to strive in one of these institutions, it becomes almost like emboldened. You become emboldened because you're like, well, I've seen this before. And I know that that's all, um, 
you know, I hate to say this, but optics is another word for BS. <laughs> So let's get the optics out of the way and let's talk directly to the individual. And when you do that and every time you do it and you see it succeed, you have to have hope because the only reason you feel hopeless is because the system wants to perpetuate that feeling of disenfranchisement, not only in the person you're trying to help, but in you as a citizen and as a person trying to help another person you being disenfranchised is part of that also operating. And so that's why it's like, we, that gives me hope is people trying to break this down. Because I mean, what would be your recommendation for somebody to, because I mean, you guys are living examples of this, but to really step outside that comfort zone and not only know that some things aren't your place, but to assert yourself in such a way to say like, hey, you know what, like, I don't think that there's enough inclusion in this school to whether you're challenging the teacher or administration. And, and I'm not talking about from the Indigenous perspective, because I don't feel that that's their responsibility to, to do that. I, I think this also has to come from the non-Indigenous community to say there is not enough. There's not enough within our curriculum. There's not enough within our classrooms. How do you suggest a student or maybe a, a teacher colleague look to administration and say, what we're doing isn't enough and I want more. I think it can be a difficult conversation. I'll throw that out there first. <laughs> uh, depending on your relationship with your administrator and all of those kind of things. Uh, I would say, first of all, don't, don't expect the indigenous teacher in the school to be the one having all those conversations. Um, you often, there is one of us in an entire school and that's not just in Calgary, that is across the board. Uh, and so those conversations need to come from a whole staff. So again, it comes to that piece of seeing value. So if you have programs like this in your school or in, in your dis school district, First of all, take the time to go and see those programs and what they are. And, and this is to the non-Indigenous staff out there. Uh, go and see the programs for what they are. Often our programs are seen as non-academic. They're seen as this is a way just to get kids through. They're not going to go to university, those kind of myths, which is very untrue of our programs. Um, they're just not Western academic, but our students actually learn the Western academics in it. So learn about those programs, talk to the staff and the teachers who are doing these programs, have conversations with the students, and empower the students to be activists as well. I think the anti-hate classroom is the way we see change. When students go to administrators and talk about hateful experiences they're having at the schools, and not just Indigenous students, uh, but students who are in the LGBTQ2 plus community, um, our immigrant students, they all face this in the schools. And so they're empowered. And the non-oppressed the non groups of students are also understanding why it's important and can stand with people of color, um, the administrators. They're actually usually receptive. Um, not all the time. I'm not going to say all the time, but they actually are often receptive and they will be more receptive usually to students uh, because the school is about the students and the students' needs. So it's about numbers. It's about educating yourself and numbers of people. So no one person feels like they have to do all this work alone. And that, I think, is how we can see change. I'll pass to you, Ms. Kay. Yeah, just to go off of that, it, it is always a complicated conversation because you never know what is motivating somebody and why they're resistant. Sometimes they're resistant because they have anxiety about messing up. Sometimes they're resistant just because they, they're recognizing in that moment, oh my gosh, I have a total lack of knowledge. Like I feel inept and I'm not trying to be a bad person. And then you have people who are resistant because they actually have never really looked closely at the ways that they have prejudices and discriminations against people because they're so covert in their life. 
And before we can like kind of adjust on where the person's at, like knowing the full person as a part of that. And this is something that we even see in indigenous to indigenous as well. Like, I mean, just cause you're indigenous doesn't mean you don't mess up. Like when I first came to a uh, Blackfoot territory, I, you know, was wrapping tobacco for an elder, but I was wrapping it in an Anishinaabe way. And, you know, my Blackfoot friend teased me about how adorable my little tobacco pouch was. And then, you know, it was a teaching moment, but it was a teasing moment. And that's where that humility aspect comes in. Like, nobody knows at all. Nobody knows everything. Um, and I mean, I used to, I've always worked with elders that are like, no, please, like, be honest. Like, you, there is nothing you can tell me that'll offend me. Like, please just tell, bring it on you know, bring it on, let's do this thing, let's get so that we can help these kids and we can do this. And once people are given that sort of comfort to be like, okay, I know nothing. I find that it's like, in indigenous culture as well, like if you're being teased, you're probably liked. <laughs> so if you're being teased in like a joking kind of loving way, it means that you're liked. And, and that's all part of that learning. I, you know, this, these conversations, I remember having conversations where, you know, if a, if a colleague came up and said, like, let's have a powwow about this assignment I want to do, you know, you make the face and you're like, oh, no, no, that's not okay. And then you explain why it's not okay. And then the person, you do it in a way where they don't feel too bad, but they understand now. But then there's also a situation where you see almost like a covert resistance where, you know, red tape is coming up with uh, receiving an elder. And it's like, I've actually seen people I've worked with just straight up tell an administrator, like, you're not ready to receive an elder just yet. You're not ready. And what that means is like, it doesn't mean you're a bad person. It doesn't mean that, you know, there's something wrong with you. It's just, you're not ready to do this in a way where I feel like you're confident in your ability to do it right. I don't know if you understand why we do these protocols. So we're going to have to educate you and then you'll be ready to receive an elder. And and just sort of explaining it, but that really depends on the person being open to that. And the reason why these conversations can be difficult, and it's something that's come up quite often with anti-racist dialogue, is that when we talk about racism, it's not a coincidence that people were raised in only white neighborhoods. It's not a coincidence that they've had mostly white doctors and white teachers. This means that this system is something where you could have not a single racist person in it, but the system itself would still operate under the racist system that it's operating under and has been for years. And so those uncomfortable conversations where we mess up and there's tears shed or jokes made or uh, really uncomfortable like faces that we make where we're like, ooh, eesh, yikes. All of that is part of what reconciliation is. Indigenous people bring the truth and the discomfort of that history, but where's the discomfort on the other side? And the discomfort on the other side is in those moments of humility and shared shame and shared concern. And once we kind of get to that point of being able to be truly vulnerable with one another, truly vulnerable and not feeling like we, have to, we can take off our jerseys and say, we're not on this side or that side. This isn't a battle. We're a family now, a quite dysfunctional one, but we have to sit out, we have to sit at dinner time together. So yeah, it's, it's sort of like, it really requires us to be like, it's like the constant circular approach of like, I check in on myself and then I check in on the other. And then you do that a million times in a conversation or a million times a day. That's really powerful. I just want to add to that with um, us as Indigenous people bringing in that discomfort with our truth. Uh, something that often happens is uh, burnout um, <laughs> with this work. So recognizing that the person that's attached to your school or your business place that has these stories around residential school, intergenerational trauma, uh, trauma in general, that they will let you know when they're okay telling those stories. Um, and being sure that it's not an expectation. Reconciliation and safe space can happen without us telling our stories. 
Uh, and so really understanding that as much as we bring those truths and those stories, we shouldn't have to all the time in order for reconciliation to happen. I'm glad you punctuated that point. Anna has written a question um, similar to, to what we're talking about now. Uh, what can parents do more though to learn and encourage their schools to do more? She says she finds this fascinating and is so happy to be able to listen to the conversation. This way of thinking would benefit all students. I could not agree more. But she wants to know, and she doesn't even know where to start. <laughs> so, I, I, I mean, also to just kind of um, play off that, I, I wanted to also, because there was a light bulb moment within that indigenization and decolonization, because I appreciated what you said that just having an orange shirt day at school is, isn't enough. So can you maybe give us some tangible examples about what maybe we as parents can be asking the schools to do more to just not have, you know, a, an acknowledgement of one day to go beyond? I will totally jump in this, in this as a parent, actually. Um, again, my daughter's grown now, but she went through uh, the public school system in I'll just say Alberta to keep it general. Um, she went through public school system and as an Indigenous parent of an Indigenous child, uh, first off, I will point out that uh, part of my story is, uh, how do I word this? Um, my great-great-grandfather was Scottish and he raped my great-great-grandmother, um, which is where my Scottish blood came in. And so I'm very white passing. I'm having announcements happen over the PA here at the school. Um, <laughs> so sorry about that. But I would say as a, so as she came into a classroom, she often was the only Indigenous student, but people didn't actually even know she was Indigenous. Um, because she doesn't quote unquote look Indigenous, or whatever that means. Uh, and so I would often see things that I do not think were intentionally racist, but were racist in the classroom. Uh, and in the school as a whole. And my first response was to get really heated and call the school and yell at them, but that was not effective. So <laughs> I would say, especially if you are part of the, the parent council, um, bringing in students, not just indigenous students and having their voice on what they want to see. I know for, for a lot of our students around Orange Shirt Day, uh, we have wanted every year to make it more and more. So yes, it's a day, but there is information leading up to that day. There's a chance and opportunity to learn, to look at residential schools, but also beyond residential schools and what is currently happening. Uh, and I think parents finding a allied teacher is really important. Um, usually the allied teachers are the ones who are putting in far more hours of work than they should, but I'm sure they will put in a little bit more to jump in, get a student group going, uh, and just really advocate. The more voices that come through to the administrators, the more likely they are to jump on it, and especially if you're part of the parent council. Thank you for that. Miss Kay, did you have anything to add to that before we move on to another question? Yeah, I just want to say too, like, let's be honest, parents have all the power in the education system, like parents can put the pressure on, I think, more than they actually realize. Um, and I think like the parent council is a great, like what Ms. O was saying is a great starting point, because it's interesting, like, the space we created at our school was a space for everybody uh, by the end of it. Um, and that when the parents saw that and saw how far the outreach was of the program, it became, you know, I think I had a good uh, conversation with a parent this year uh, where we were just talking about how her daughter was really loving her class this year, because I was teaching this year. And she said that it's because like you're teaching history, but you're teaching it from a way of through a different lens. And it's sort of how we do everything, right? Like we'll teach like with Orange Shirt Day, we'll do a minority action here, but we're never talking about, well, why is it that we have to make such a concerted effort to celebrate these things in bursts 
And the reason why is because we never really talked about why these traditions and peoples have been oppressed for so long and by whom and for whom. And I think if I know like every parent I talk to for the most part is just jealous that their student gets an opportunity to potentially learn these things. I had so many students uh, enrolled in Indigenous education and the majority of them were non-Indigenous students who just wanted to learn. Um, and, you know, when parents start to say things like, you know, we, we would do events like throughout the year where it wasn't just like a big thing, but we would bring in like DJs who were Indigenous, we'd bring in journalists who were Indigenous. It would go from being like a party community setting of everybody can be together to being a small panel group for people as well. We even incorporated Indigenous models into the GSA with some of our parents who were allies, but in having two spirit students express that history, it actually gave other students in the GSA a feeling like, oh, it hasn't always been a bad thing to be gay, which or trans or non-binary, like it blew their minds. And when the parents saw that, they became more involved. And I think if it comes from parents who are non-Indigenous, especially that sort of pressure, like being like, well, this is what I saw happening at this school. Like, could this be kind of cool to do at our school? It actually has a, a bigger heft to it because it's actually showing that the consciousness of the school culture has reached a tipping point where even non-Indigenous parents are wanting this. So it got a lot more power than I think you realize, parents. <laughs> Power to the parents. Uh, I love that. Um, Miss O, oh, Diane is asking, do you know the name of the poem that you read during your presentation? Uh, it has no name. It's my own writing. It's unpublished. And so it, it is not, I often don't name my poetry. So it is an unnamed piece of poetry and it's not anywhere. So I'm sorry. <laughs> It's only in my own poetry book and now to you lovely people at Global Fest who I sent my outline to. <laughs> that is the only place it's written. So, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, you should write that down somewhere because it's, it's really powerful. Darlene has a comment and a question. I know this presentation is focused on Alberta but can either of you touch on the recent events in Quebec that have left two indigenous people dead due to apparently mistreatment by the medical staff and system? As an Albertan who wants to be an accomplice or a co-resistor, what can I do to make sure that this gets properly looked into and fixed? So yeah, that, that is a huge question that I think could probably be another like five hour presentation. But first of all, to recognize, I. I cried when I read that, when that happened. Um, but I also wanna recognize that also in British Columbia, there was stuff happening in the emergency rooms where nurses were having a poll on what blood alcohol level indigenous patients were. Um, it was then made public. Uh, there's also massive land claim issues where indigenous people are getting harmed, protecting their own land. There's the, there's the fishermen, the lobster fishermen out in uh, in the east there that are currently got attacked last night or the night before and nothing was done. Um, so there's a lot of stuff going on all over and also in the, in the states, our cousins down there and what's happening with them as well. So I think what Kay was talking around around being an ally and being a true ally, standing up you hear of things like this happening, um, things like what we're doing today happening, show up, learn. Uh, if you hear of a community conversation coming up, show up, learn. If you hear about a white supremacist group that's going to stop a peaceful protest, show up, make sure that we're not getting harmed. Uh, it all comes to being that ally no matter what it is. You can also write letters to health authorities in particular. If they get enough letters, hopefully it'll be addressed. I am not going to say it will or won't, but you write letters to your MLAs. Make sure that when you see these news stories, if they suddenly disappear, contact your media and say, hey, can you do a follow-up on what's happening in this situation? Because often we see the horrific news story and then we don't see what happens next. 
sector. So reach out to all of these people who have some a lot of power and voice through letters. And then, yeah, just show up as an ally. That's going to make a big difference across Canada, no matter what's going on. That's it to you, Kay. Yes, and, and that's the thing. It's like, I, you know, for anyone who's Indigenous, like each one of these stories just ties into one long thread of horrifying stories that have been occurring for generations. And it can feel like suffocating sometimes because, you know, each, I, I never look at statistics or data as just a number. It's always a person. It was always somebody who, you know, had a full life. And, you know, this is something that we've known about for quite a long time. I mean, so many times, um, you know, Indigenous people have been presumed to be drunk in an emergency room, and it turns out they were having a stroke that they were sent home with. Like, th this is um, that bias, that prejudice that seeps in and poisons people. And I think that what Miso was saying is really a big part of it. It's, um, you know, showing up, like showing up to hear stories, coming to vigils, coming to protests, following up, putting that pressure on, recognizing that like, although the goal in the last 20 years has been to disenfranchise people that you have to enfranchise yourself. And by doing that, it's by saying like, me being here is meaningful. Me being here with my full and undivided attention is meaningful without having to take up space just to be present. And you know, like, I, I was at the um, the vigil just recently in Calgary uh, for Sisters in Spirit, um, and the English family were there, you know, and they've been walking across Alberta, um, and that that was a horrific crime, and it horrifies everyone, and then people move on, but the family is still out there telling their story, trying to speak that truth, and. I, I hesitate to understand what it would feel like to be standing there and to see a group of people actually care that you've never seen before care. And, um, you know, that feeling of like, I, I need to, we need to stop this, we need to get it done. That's what we feel every day. But it's also, we're healing at the same time, because the atrocities are so numbered and just and each one touched a life that that feeling of like I can't do anything is actually a way that we can block ourselves from even doing the smallest amount that could help and so you know if you're there's so like there's a lot of indigenous uh alliance organizations there's events that are going on becoming accustomed to those like using social media or websites would be a way because you're going to feel like though that will create actual avenues for you to get connected to the people where if you want to become even more involved, you can become more involved. It's going to be very hard to just meet online, but if you're out at a vigil or at um, a protest or at a circle, you will meet people at those groups. Even now during COVID with Zoom, you will meet people where you can say, hey, I really want to become a part of this. I really want to help you guys with your next event. Can I show up and do something? You, you'll find it just sort of organically finding your place. But sometimes we can't do that or we feel stuck because the problem seems so vast. It seems so vast. And that's where ceremony comes in. And the only way you can do that is, you know, with yourself or with others. So. <laughs> Well, I, I want to be really respectful of everybody's time and uh, keep this to time. Um, so I want to pause this conversation. I say pause because this is a conversation we need to keep having. We're going to keep having it um, just offline. I hope that you, um, you know, take these conversations into your homes, at the dinner table, at the workplace. I want to thank both Miss K and O. I think you're both brilliant, very impressive, just very articulate. And I say that with a lot of humility because um, I think we have a lot of learning to do and to have the both of you at the helm within our school system, it gives me a lot of hope. So thank you very much for the work that you're doing. I am more than grateful. 
And I thank those participants who joined us today for this very inspiring conversation. We want to thank our funding partners again, the United Nations Association of Canada, Calgary Branch, the Calgary Catholic Immigration Society, and the Canadian Red Cross. A reminder that these sessions are continuing. There is one more tomorrow morning on anti-racist kids and how to raise them. That begins at 10 a.m. My colleague Jody Hughes is going to be moderating that. I want to thank Global Fest once again for inviting me back and hosting the four sessions that I had the privilege of doing. It was an honor and I'm very grateful. So everyone, I bid you a wonderful rest of the afternoon. Thanks kindly.